Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Brian Hook, Vice Chairman for Global Investments at uh, Cerberus Capital Management. And um, it's a great privilege and honor to be here today, especially with my good friend Jared, to discuss something that we worked on uh, extensively. I, uh, during my four years in the State Department during the Trump administration, uh, I was a member of the Middle East Peace Process team that was led by Jared at the direction of the President. And uh, Richard Adias, uh, who is an honorary member of our peace process team, uh, invited us here to uh, reflect on the Abraham Accords um, that were so important for the Middle East uh, and for the world. Um, but today's um, session happens to take place in the context of News yesterday um, that was very troubling, especially to those of us who served in the administration, and I wonder if uh, you would like an opportunity to comment on that before we jump into the Middle East. Sure, thank you, Brian. And we'll talk about the Abraham Accords shortly, which were uh, totally unprecedented, but I think what was announced last night was also uh, very unprecedented. And as an American, it's very troubling to me to see the leader of the opposition party uh, be indicted. And I think that that shows, obviously, the fear that the Democrats have of Trump and the political strength that he has. And just as a family member, uh, obviously, Ivanka and I uh, love him very much. It's, uh, it's been hard to watch uh, the opponents of him politically continue to break every norm over the last years to try to, uh, to, try to get him. And um, you know, we've seen them uh, accuse him of uh, colluding with Russia. We, we saw them impeach him. We saw them raid his home. And, all this is a continuation of, of that. Uh, but what I'll say is I've been by him during a lot of these instances and it's only made him stronger and his resolve to take on big challenges, to fight for change, to fight for the American people has only gotten stronger. And you know we're here talking about the Middle East today and that is an area where the same people who have attacked him and ridiculed him, uh, ridiculed him every step of the way. So they attacked his choice of representative to lead the effort. They attacked us, everything we did. Um, and President Trump was able to achieve uh, historic results in that regard. And that's, that's why the region's changed. It's made it better for so many people. And, um, and it's something that we're all very, very proud of. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, l let me take you back to April, um, a few months into office, and you were thinking at the time about the president's first trip overseas. And it was your advice that he go to Saudi Arabia and to Israel and to Rome. Um, talk about the, the Middle East that President Trump inherited coming into office. And why did you make the case that the president should focus on the Middle East for his first trip as president? So I, I learned a lot about politics from President Trump during the campaign, and I recognized that he was always at his best when he was being himself, and, and himself as being bold and being different. And whereas a lot of the traditional people we were working with were saying, let's go to Canada or Mexico and kiss a baby and you know, do some you know, worthless thing, uh, I said, well, let's go to where the biggest problem is. And on the 2016 campaign, uh, ISIS w was a massive issue. Uh, we had um, the, 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 the talking points that people used, the experts, were to say, we need to defeat the territorial caliphate of ISIS, and then we need to win the long-term battle against extremism. And it was a big issue here in America. You had the San Bernardino shooting, the Pulse nightclub shooting, where people were radicalized online. And there was a lot of fear of, of it spreading even further. So if you go to the Middle East, and it wasn't just the previous administration, it was the two previous administrations that really made a big mess over there. So we inherited a situation uh, which was hard to imagine it could have been any worse, where ISIS had a caliphate the size of Ohio. Uh, Iran was now flush with cash after the disaster disastrous deal. Uh, they were on a glide path to nuclear weapons. They were using their riches to fund Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, destabilize their neighbors. Syria was in a civil war where over 500,000 civilians were killed. Uh, Libya was destabilized. Yemen was destabilized. Egypt. Uh, was almost destabilized, but on the, you know, really in a very uh, precarious situation. And all of America's traditional allies in Israel and the Gulf felt very alienated by the last administration. So other than that, things were perfect over there. And um, when President Trump asked me to work on it, um, I, 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 maybe because I didn't have any experience there, that's why I was willing to give it a shot. 
And what he said is, I don't want to go and just try to move things around and manage the problems. I want to try to change the problems. And so uh, going to the Middle East for that trip, we were able to uh, be connected at the time with a, a young leader in Saudi Arabia at the time, was the deputy crown prince, who was sending messages that he wanted to do big transformation. And the fights that I had, and again, you were kind of stuck in the middle of these things as you know, policy planning was, uh, was from the traditionalists saying, Number one, uh, the Saudis will never come through. These transformations will never happen. Uh, and me having no experience saying, well, if somebody's telling you they want to change and if we agree with the change, let's give them a shot to try to do it. And so we worked very hard on the trip and the deliverables from it were, were truly uh, historic. And if you go to the messaging, which I think is actually the, the place to look because it really set the framework for the next years of policy, uh, you had uh, King Salman and President Trump both give speeches that uh, agreed on these are the outcomes we want. We want economic prosperity. These not, we're not going to point fingers. Uh, we're not going to talk about our differences. Let's talk about what our shared goals are. Let's make this all of our problems and let's work together to transform and change. Uh, during that trip, we signed a lot of business deals that created jobs for America, did a lot of deals that created more defense integration uh, and burden sharing. Uh, but I think even more importantly than both of those, we did a deal that opened a counter-extremism center in, in Saudi. So Saudi was basically saying, we're the custodians of, of the two holy mosques. Uh, we are going to be the leaders in fighting back against uh, Islamic extremism. And then they opened a counter-terror finance center, which gave us access to all of the banking system in the Middle East to really fight uh, money that was going to bad actors. And so uh, it really was a fundamental turning point in the Middle East. And uh, again, you see what leaders do is they, they come together, they set bold ambitions, they, they lead, and that trip really set the stage for what happened over the next years. Obviously, it's the Middle East, so there's always you know, ups and downs, twists and turns, bumps, yeah. major bumps, small bumps along the way, but we had great partners in the region, um, and we all believed that it was worth really fighting for, and so I think you know, we may have even surprised ourselves at the end with the results we were able to achieve because when we were starting, everything was so unthinkable. Um, President Trump's speech in Riyadh and the companion speech by King Salman, um, I think it's been a while since those were given, but those speeches presented a vision, um, which was a new vision for the Middle East. And as you said, sort of looking to do very big things, the president talked about like a principled realism, focusing on like shared interests and common security, prosperity, countering extremism. Over the next four years, uh, you would execute against that vision. Um, I saw firsthand, you know, Jared's approach uh, to diplomacy, as he said, he came to it with not a lot of uh, experience in this space, but that was an asset. Zero, not a lot that you're yeah, overestimating, yeah, so. Um, yeah. I would say American diplomats are probably not famous for their listening skills. But um, Jared really put in the time and listened. Uh, talk about when you came into the region and you start making these trips by yourself with the president, um, being on the road, uh, listening to where the opportunities were. Uh, how did you approach diplomacy in the Middle East, uh, not you know, coming to it with kind of a, a fresh set of eyes? So I, I think one of the differences uh, that we did is number one, because I didn't, um, number one is I didn't have the experience and number two is all the people who were trying to explain to me how to do the job, uh, who I, I sought their opinions out, uh, number one had no track record of success and number two were giving me advice that just didn't make logical sense. So, uh, so I just kept talking to more and more people and trying to say a very fundamental thing, which is America has a lot of power and if you were America, what would you do? You're here, you, you were here before I got here, you'll be here after I, I, I leave. Um, how would you approach this? And what I found was that there was a different paradigm than I had been previously uh, told by a lot of the experts. So people always said you have, you have the Sunni-Shia divide and that's the big thing that's dividing the Middle East. And what I saw from speaking to different leaders was that the fundamental divide was between leaders who wanted to give economic empowerment and opportunity to their next generation and leaders who wanted to subvert religion in order to um, distract from their failures and uh, in order to maintain power. And that was the divide that I saw. And so when you leave the Sunni Shia paradigm, which was a traditional framework, and you go to more who's trying to move the region forward and who's trying to bring it backwards, you were able to create a different, I, I just saw a different board than other people. Yeah. And then it was about 
getting people to say, okay, well, there's certain issues that you're focused on that you're giving way too much waiting for, right? You're, you're focused on the past, and we're not gonna solve something that happened 70 years ago, or 50 years ago, or 30 years ago. Um, let's, let's like, try to shrink that a little bit, and let's focus on what are our shared interests? What can we gain together by focusing on the future? And it was really through a lot of conversations, a lot of trust, a lot of meetings, a lot of dinners, and, and time together, that we were able to build trust and agree on a framework for what was achievable, and then, again, we, we, you know, a lot of twists and turns along the way, but we were able to make some breakthroughs that, uh, that nobody thought possible. And, and again, I will just say personally, you know, it's just very gratifying to continue to see uh, the region uh, grow. I think it's one of the most exciting places in the world right now. Um, and, uh, and the Abraham Accords have really, you know, and, and the work we did with Saudi Arabia have really uh, been a fork in the road, and, and it really pivoted in a way that's way more positive. We don't talk about all the, the negative that we avoided because that's kind of your job. Um, but the positive that we're seeing that's impacting people's lives, making them safer, giving them more opportunity uh, is just amazingly gratifying to see. Um, the, the work you did on a, 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 a vision for peace and prosperity for the Palestinian people and then a political vision to, uh, on, the, on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, you worked on these two projects, and then out of that, as a result of that work, came the Abraham Accords. Um, talk to me about uh, that process. Uh, like you said, you were, you were open, you were uh, ready for opportunities as they came your way. Uh, it was a byproduct of our work on the Middle East peace process that, uh, that brought the Abraham Accords to fruition. Yeah, so, so once you go to the framework of you have people trying to make people's lives better and people trying to keep power, and don't really care about the people. Um, the, 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 the glaring example that I saw was really Saudi Arabia. And I, I saw the Crown Prince's Vision 2030 as a framework for how do you set KPIs? Uh, what are your goals? I mean, I got to the US government and nobody said, okay, these are our objectives and goals. These are our plans. These are our KPIs. I said, but it was kind of a, a smart idea as a country to do it. So I kind of tore through the document. Uh, I consulted with the Crown Prince who gave me a lot of uh, amazing advice. And, um, and I said, well, why don't I try to do something to improve the lives of the Palestinian people? And that was really what it was. And then obviously I was introduced to, to Richard Atheist who, uh, who came and, and really you know, made magic happen for us in Bahrain. And you know, it was funny, people were criticized in the conference because uh, the Palestinian business people were prohibited from attending from the leadership, but the media buzz in the Middle East, first of all, it was amazing to get Israelis to be allowed into Bahrain. That was a first. And it was, again, another you know, chip away at the old paradigms and showing people that their worst fears weren't as bad as all of the, you know, the critics kind of claimed they would be. But then also allowing the leaders to see the media regionally uh, was basically saying, what the hell's wrong with, with the leadership that they're creating a plan, they're, they're offering $50 billion to them to improve their lives, create a million jobs, reduce poverty, uh, reduce unemployment. Um, and, uh, and they're not even showing up and engaging. And so that was just another pathway forward. But again, it's, um, I find in politics is, is people uh, are always getting stuck in these issues that are small, right? They, you know, they, they, they like keeping division, it keeps people in power, it keeps them with their different holds. But I, I always learned that in politics, when people are looking left or right or focused on small things, the best direction is always forward. And what we just did in the Middle East is we said, this is what the future can be. You know, it's, it's real, it's achievable. We got the leading businessmen from around the world and from the region to come say this is achievable. And I think that just continued to build momentum and give people confidence for what's doable. And I will say, you know, I want to thank, obviously, um, uh, His Excellency uh, Yasser Aramayan. I want to thank Mayor Suarez. I want to thank uh, Princess Rima for putting this together in Miami because I think Saudi Arabia and Miami are two places in the world that are shining examples of places that are on the rise, places that are not being bogged down by the past, places that are open-minded, people are coming together, uh, people who have different political views, they talk to each other, they're, they're coming together, we're, we're debating, we're talking, uh, and we're saying, how do we make our lives better? How do we help each other? How do we advance our societies? And I say with Miami, one of the things, um, there, there's two things I love about Miami. Number one is the lifestyle, right? You come here and I, I tell everybody, it's like I live on vacation and then uh, then I go to work, I work hard, I get back in my car and I'm right back on vacation. And so it's, it's an amazing place. But I always believe that everything is a product of its ingredients. And, and here in Miami, you now have people from all over the world and all over the country coming together and saying, how do we make this the best city possible? And so the amount of collaboration I see forming organically uh, between people to say, how do we make this city better and better, uh, I think will we'll, we'll yield amazing results. And the FII 
coming to Miami now perhaps can become a real organizing function to allow everyone to, to, to become even more precise and then have even better execution towards Miami achieving its, its full potential, uh, as we're seeing now in Saudi Arabia, where it continues to, um, to, to outstrip everyone's expectation. Um, you were able to um, negotiate uh, five peace agreements uh, in five months uh, at the end of the administration, which I, I don't know of anybody who has a similar record of success uh, negotiating these normalization agreements. Um, what do the Abraham Accords mean for the Middle East? What do they mean for the world? What do they mean for the future? What countries do you see coming into the Abraham Accords, and how do we expand them and build on this great platform? So, so the, the practical implications have been tremendous. Right now you have business happening in the Middle East that wouldn't happen. Uh, you know, you have uh, defense agreements that are happening which wouldn't happen. So all of that is very important. The, the biggest thing for me is, is really two things. Number one is uh, you're seeing um, Arabs now finally and Muslims being able to say nice things about Israel and Jews. And you're having human-to-human -human connections, uh, which I think is now finally pushing back against the opposition, which has tried to keep that away and, and, and not allow that to happen. So that's a growing uh, energy, uh, which is not a historical aberration, actually. If you go back to pre-World War II, uh, the Jews and the Muslims and the Christians, they lived together very peacefully for many, many years. And so I think it's, it's a, the beginning of the return to that time. Yeah. But more importantly, uh, what I find is that um, the biggest barriers that we usually have are just in our mind. And I think the Abraham Accord showed us that everything's possible. You look at our geopolitics, and I was always surprised when people talk about how U.S. and Russia are adversaries. I'd say, well, in World War II, they were with us against the Nazis, and then we're, you know, we're supporting the Germans and, and the Japanese. And it just shows there's, there's no such thing as permanent enemies, and there's no such thing as permanent alliances, and that anything is truly possible. And so if you just focus on kind of, you know, what are our shared um, goals, what are the things that can make us have, be better as people, be better as humanity, then anything could be achieved. And so it was uh, amazingly gratifying to work on it. I think we had a lot more momentum um, that unfortunately hasn't been recognized over the last yeah. couple of years, but, uh, but it's, it's been growing by itself and I think it's still there. And I, I hope the, you know, the, the people in power now will uh, be able to pick up where we left off and, and continue to push that momentum forward because a lot of people really want to see it happen. Let me ask one more question, um, your post-government life. When, when Jared and I left office, um, mm. neither of us knew what we were going to be doing. And um, you ended we, up- We did play some good golf though, which was good. So. <laughs> we did play some very good golf, yes. Um, uh, you ended up, we both ended up going into private equity. Uh, you're with, uh, you founded Affinity. You have investors from the United States, Israel, Qatar, Saudi, UAE. Um, looking to make investments around the world. Um, what have you enjoyed more, uh, government service or the private sector? Uh, and what are, the, what are the lessons you learned in both spaces? So, so it's funny, I, I was asked um, a similar question the other day and, and I, what I said to the person is they said, how do you like being a businessman versus being in government? And I said, well, when you're in government, it's, um, it's very intense and, and everyone's always coming to you and saying, uh, there, there's a really big problem and you have to solve it. So when you're in business, you're meeting with the most amazing entrepreneurs, the most creative people, the most ambitious people, and they're coming to you every day and saying, there is a really big problem, and I have a solution to that problem. I just need a little bit of capital and a little bit of help. So number one, I'll start by saying, you, you, you spend time with a, a much more positive group of people than you do when you're in government. Um, not that being said, I, I do have a tremendous respect and appreciation for people who are serving in government. and. It's, it's a very big sacrifice, and, and, and there are a, a tremendous amount of great people who do that. Um, but what I will say is that, you know, one of the things that I think President Trump got very well and was central to a lot of the, 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 the policy we did domestically and foreign policy is that government has a really important role in setting policy. And then the private sector has a really important role in implementing. And so um, in different parts of the world, there's different levels of, of cooperation between the private sector and governments. And what I'm finding now uh, from a business point of view is that understanding how governments work, understanding government priorities, and then understanding big macro trends, um, and then also having a global network, I'm able to work with different companies all over the world and help them accelerate the different things they're doing. So I didn't start by saying, I wanna you know, start, a, I mean, the world didn't need another $3 billion private equity fund. So I wasn't saying, let me start and try to be like everybody else, I said, let me try to figure out how we can be different, what we can be. And the goal was to be complementary to everybody and competitive to, to nobody. 
And to really say that when you go around the world, um, in order to accomplish an objective, I always say you need five things. You need technical capabilities, you need execution capability, you need local navigation skills, you need capital, and then you need to be able to project manage the whole stack of expertise. And I think at the firm what we're doing is we're finding ways through investments or strategic partnerships or through just our, our, our network of relationships and the trust and credibility, credibility we have to be somebody who can bring together a lot of those different elements in order to be an accelerator towards uh, different initiatives that we think are worthwhile. And so it's been a, a lot of fun so far. It's, it's always hard starting from something from scratch. And, uh, but I've been very, very blessed. I have amazing partners. I, I have amazing uh, you know, power partners that I work with and colleagues in, in, in the office. Uh, and so far, it's just been a lot of fun. And, and most importantly, it, it does give you the ability to be your own boss, where you can spend more time with your family and your children. And, and I'll say that for, for my wife and myself, like that's been probably our, our biggest reward is just the ability to be in control and to, to really get that family time that we, uh, that we really uh, wanted to have after our time in, in service. That's great. Jared, thank you for spending time with us this morning. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Okay, thank you.